Hey, Joe Brunsman here, back again with another video for you. Of course, cyber insurance broker, master's in cybersecurity law, author of two books on cyber insurance. And today we're going to be talking about something I've been trying to get my hands on for quite a while here, and this is personal cyber insurance. So not business cyber insurance, personal cyber insurance. And we're going to look through that, figure out what it is. So the path today, we're going to be seeing, all right, what's likely to be covered under this type of policy, what's unlikely to be covered, and are there any interesting clauses inside of there? So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the policy. All right, so first off, you can see here, this is from Pure. As far as I'm aware, there's actually only two companies offering this right now, uh, both Pure and Chubb. And this is their fraud and cyber defense coverage. Of course, it says, please read it carefully. Yes, we shall. And you'll notice here in highlights, this is part of a high value homeowners policy. So as far as I'm aware, there is no standalone personal cyber insurance policy. They're all coming as endorsements to these high value homeowners policies. Uh, from my research, I believe through Pure, and don't quote me on this, uh, you have to have a, a specific policy with these guys, and your value has, I'm sorry, the, the value of your home has to be valued at over $1 million. So this here, you can see there's really the schedule there. Uh, two different coverages up to 100,000 with a deductible of 500. Later on, we'll see you can get this up uh, to a million dollars in coverage with a specific caveat there. So pretty interesting. All right, in the first coverage here, it's saying there is a section one that's for cyber attack. So it essentially says if there's been a cyber attack and it's discovered by you during the policy period and you report it to us, then this is the coverage that's going to be provided. So it's going to cover data recovery costs and system restoration costs. So let's go ahead and figure out what that means. All right, so data recovery costs here means the cost of a professional firm hired by you. So that's interesting. It looks like you're going to have to hire uh, the data recovery firm. And it does not mean cost to research, recreate, or replace any of the following. Software programs or operating systems that are not commercially available, data, data that cannot be reasonably replaced, including but not limited to personal photos, movies, or other recordings for which no backup is available. So kind of a warning there really in the black and white, which is, hey, if you have these priceless uh, memories and they're only on one system, you should probably have a backup for that system. Uh, also three, something not covered data that is obsolete, unnecessary, or useless to you. So the other item that was covered there were the system restoration costs under a cyber attack. So that means, once again, the cost of a professional firm hired by you to do the following in order to restore your computing device or connected home device to the level of functionality it had before the cyber attack. So replace or reinstall computer software programs, remove malicious code, configure, correct the configuration of your device or system. It does not mean, and this is important here, the cost to repair or replace hardware. But then there's a caveat there that they may pay for that replacement or repair the hardware if doing so reduces the amount of loss payable under this endorsement. So where could that really come into play? Uh, a good example of that would be bricking coverage. So they overwrite the firmware, so essentially the instructions um, on the hardware of your system. It renders it unusable. Maybe that could be an instance where they would come back in and actually cover that loss. Section two there of coverage, you'll see cyber extortion. So essentially they're talking about a cyber extortion event against you or another insured. Okay, why is that important? All right, they're also going to pay... Uh, reimbursement, so note that reimbursement of your necessary and reasonable cyber extortion payments. Let's figure out what a cyber extortion event and a cyber extortion payment actually means. All right, so here we go. This is back up in the, uh, the previous page of the policy. A cyber extortion event means a demand for money or other considerations. And this is involving both a computing device or a connected home device. Why would that really be important? Well, increasingly, you know, obviously we've had laptops, tablets, cell phones, etc. Um, in the home for decades now, but increasingly we have this internet of things where you've got, say, a Nest thermostat or you have a smart fridge. They even have smart trash cans now, uh, which I found uh, particularly funny why you would need that. I have no idea. Uh, but a lot of those are not necessarily manufactured with security in mind. So there could be you know, some administrative passwords inside of there that you would just have no idea. So, you know, for example, my mother-in-law's fridge could be connected to her bank account so that she could just shop online via her fridge. So in theory, yeah, someone could actually hack your fridge, try and get into your bank account, uh, possibly extort you for money saying, hey, we're not going to unlock your smart fridge unless you pay us $500. Uh, or they could just go into your bank account there and try and steal money or extort you for that. So that's actually pretty interesting. Cyber extortion payments... 
means cyber extortion payments as directed by the extortion threat, but only when that payment is one incurred as a direct result of a cyber extortion event directed against you or another insured. So your insured is both you and your family in this policy and approved by us in advance. So what that really means here is, yeah, if you have some cyber extortion event, you do have some reporting requirements here. So you'd want to talk to your general insurance guy, uh, whoever's working on this homeowner's policy to really see how that would actually come about in practice, right? How do they actually approve that extortion payment? Then they have a caveat here. However, at our reasonable discretion, we may pay for cyber extortion payments that were not approved in advance by us if we determine the following. It was not practical for you to obtain our prior approval. And if consulted at the time, we would have approved that payment. Uh, what that actually means in practice, I have no idea. It'd be interesting to see an actual case where, you know, Pure truly did pay out on this. Uh, without any written prior approval. They actually just reimbursed the homeowner for that cost. But in the meantime, at least there's a little caveat there. All right, so, so far we've covered a cyber attack, a cyber extortion, and then section three here is gonna be fraud. So this is for a cyber or other fraud event against you or an insured. So now we need to figure out, okay, what is a cyber or other fraud event? And this is where it gets long. You see the highlights on the page there. So it means any of the following, an identity fraud. So we're gonna look at the definition of that. The unauthorized use of say, credit cards, bank account information, brokerage account, investment account, or other financial institution, where you are not entitled legally to reimbursement from the financial institution. So, you know, broadly speaking, I think in most instances, that financial institution is going to be legally liable to reimburse you for that. I believe there's some caveat there with debit cards, right? So whereas credit cards, I think it's anything over $50. Um, they're legally required to reimburse you. I think for debit cards, I don't believe so. Don't quote me on that. But generally, I think a financial institution, financial institution would reimburse you for that. Uh, but it would be good if you just somehow have theft of, say, your brokerage account or your investment account, and there's just no insurance on that. Um, then, you know, if they're not legally entitled to reimburse you, at least you'd have this kind of backup here. The forgery or alteration of any check or negotiable instrument. An intentional and criminal deception of an insured or an unauthorized representative of an insured to endorse the insured, I'm sorry, endorse, induce the insured or the insured's authorized representative to part voluntarily with something of value. So what that sounds like there is potentially some coverage for like a social engineering type loss. But let's keep, let's keep going. It does not mean any occurrence in which the insured was threatened or coerced to part with something of value. So that would be an extortion. So this particular coverage part is not covering extortion. Uh, three, involving the use of a card, credit number, or account number associated with a bank account, credit account, brokerage account, investment account, or other financial institution. If an insured has not complied with all the terms and conditions under which such card card number or account number has been issued. So you can't just do whatever you want and assume that you're still gonna have coverage here. You still need to play by the rules is what they're saying. It's also another uh, exception here is an advanced fee fraud or other fraud in which an insured provides money based on an expectation of receiving at some future time, a larger amount of money or something with a greater value than the money provided but only when such a scheme is reasonably recognizable as fraudulent at the time that the payment is made by the insured. So what could that huge paragraph mean? So that really appears to say like, hey, if you fall for an, you know, the Nigerian print scam where, hey, you send me $500, I have to get a million dollars of gold out of the country. And if you do that, then we're gonna go ahead and give you half a million dollars. It looks like something like that should be reasonably recognizable as fraudulent, so they wouldn't reimburse you for that. But let's say you fell for a scam where it looks like uh, a family member um, is coming after you for, say, money because ostensibly they're in a Mexican jail and they need to pay off the cops. And you wire that money and it turns out it was fraudulent. Well, you know, let's say they actually were in Mexico at the time and, you know, maybe that could be legit. So... You know, it looks like here there's a caveat where you can't fall for the really dumb fraud, but if you fall for a more sophisticated fraud, the policy may actually respond to that. 
All right, moving on, we're going to jump into the exclusion section here. Not a lot that's particularly interesting in this portion, except for really two caveats there. One, it's saying that they're not going to pay for any loss arising from a business or incidental business. So obviously, that's why your business still needs actual cyber insurance. And then they also had this really interesting clause right here. And it said, if the fraud in cyber defense annual aggregate limit shown in the schedule is a million dollars, this limit will be, be reduced to a quarter million if you let your active cyber monitoring service lapse and that lapse reasonably contributed to the loss. Now up here at the very top, when the, uh, the definitions began, there's actually the definition of active cybersecurity monitoring service. And it is quite lengthy, but it means an electronic security and privacy protection service that includes a continuous monitoring of data exchange on all, keyword there, all of the insured's smartphones, tablets, and computers right, including both algorithmic and active monitoring and oversight by cybersecurity experts in order to identify and block cyber attacks, which we talked about, cyber extortion events, which we talked about, and data breaches, including any service agreed to in advance by us. So I would wonder if Pure, you know, has these services already available for you. The, the one thing I would say there that you really have to be careful about is I think what they're really getting at with this active cybersecurity monitoring service would be like antivirus protection um, in layman's terms. So both antivirus and anti-malware protection on all of your phones, tablets, or computers. A lot of people actually don't have that in their home devices. So even if you end up not purchasing something like this, you really need to have that antivirus protection on all of your digital devices. Yes, there are scams. There are you know payloads of malware specifically directed towards those cell phones. If you don't have that already, you need to make sure you have it. It looks like they're trying to induce you to do that, that if you have the million dollar coverage, they're gonna knock that coverage down. If you don't have it in place or you have it lapse, I would just presume as part of the application process for this endorsement, there must be some questionnaire on if you actually have this current and running on all of your electronic devices. But that would uh, obviously be for another episode. All right, and with that, let's look at, you know, let's kind of narrow it back down into the possible use scenarios. So maybe you personally fall for some sort of social engineering scam or a family member does in your household. You have identity theft from some sort of unknown resource or unknown source, excuse me. You fall victim to war driving. So let's say you live in a, you know, high net worth type of neighborhood and war driving is where kids are just driving around looking for those unsecured networks or those networks where say you haven't changed the, default password on your router and those passwords are publicly available. Now they start snooping around and they could hit you with some sort of cyber crime or extortion event. Obviously personal extortion. If somebody personally comes after you, uh, that's obviously becoming more prevalent as well as personal sextortion scams. All right. What are my final thoughts on this? Well, would I actually buy this? Uh, yeah, I actually probably would. And the reason I probably would is because it seems like the coverage is decent. Obviously, you have to make your own decision with your own insurance professional. I'm not providing official insurance advice here. I'm not your attorney. But would I buy this? Yeah, I probably would. Uh, only because devices are getting smarter and smarter. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where it's going to be impossible to have a dumb home. Uh, there's going to be you know, other insurance products on the market, such as you know, flood monitoring devices for basements. They're going to lower insurance anyways. So as our homes get smarter and our footprints in the digital world get bigger, it just kind of makes sense to start having this personal cyber insurance. Now, I would just imagine that this is going to be standard fare in the next five to 10 years, where it's just going to be something that every homeowner just automatically puts on their policy uh, without really any second thought whatsoever. Currently, it's only available for those high net worth uh, clients or those people living in very valuable homes. But yeah, I'd, I'd actually probably buy this myself. Now, I would prefer to see the pre-qualified vendors list to just kind of figure out who actually they're doing business with. I'm sure that, you know, if I was selling homeowners insurance, I could probably have access to that if I was if I was a uh, an agent of Pure there. Also, keep in mind, no matter what you do, you have to keep that antivirus active and up to date. Uh, doubly so, you need to check that if you actually have this endorsement on your policy. Obviously, there's limited available availability right now. I kind of talked about. I think this will really just be standard fare moving forward. And you still need to be smart and diligent. So you're not going to be falling for those Nigerian print scams. That's why I think really every person, especially those not in the technology world on a day-to-day -day basis, need to be undergoing some sort of security awareness training. So whether it's 
you know, if you're getting it in the office and you have to do that, it's just part of your regular course of business. That's outstanding. If not, I'd recommend if you're a high net worth individual, you just do that on your own um, and make your family members do it just to try and avoid as many of these scams as possible. They are very, very prevalent. It's very easy to fall to them. So make sure you're staying on your toes there. All right, with that, if you like this presentation, like, share, subscribe, uh, spread this to your friends to make sure they stay out of trouble. This is where you can get a download of my new book on cyber insurance and cybersecurity law. If you want to, you can also buy it on Amazon. And with that, stay safe.